Hey everybody, it's Gomledex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of Murders at Karlov Manor. Without further ado, let's get into our pack one pick one, which is really funny. Really showing off these new play boosters, where you can open up three rares, two of which are the exact same dual land. Yep, this is draft in 2024. Uh, so our rares are all very bad, so we'll just take a shock here for super efficient, cheap removal. Clears out whatever we need. Very good at clearing out disguise cards as well, because we can just pay for that ward, uh, being able to shock them for only three mana. Most flexible card, strongest for such a cheap mana cost. We'll take that here. Not a great pack. Pack one, pick number two. There's a person of interest to go with our shock. There's also Karlov Watchdog, which is absurd in Boros Aggro, and that could be a great place to go after a pack one, pick one shock. There's a lot of cards in this format like Person of Interest that are spitting out multiple creatures off the one card to make sure you have a wide enough board state to trigger the plus one plus one to everybody that the Karlov Watchdog it gives you. So this can just stack up a ton of extra damage and it forces your opponent to not be able to use their disguise cards as combat tricks. So I think this card is busted enough uh, to take Watchdog and potentially head towards Boros Aggro here. We've also got an Arch Druid's Charm, which is pretty cool, but incredibly inflexible. Triple green means you have to be deep, deep, deep into green. So we'll just take the watchdog here. Pick number three. Here's another incredible Boros Aggro card, Neighborhood Guardian. Again, with all the cards in the format that spit out 2-2 two, two, and 1-1 one, one tokens, this can get a lot of triggers for those plus one, plus one. And even if you aren't that kind of deck, it still helps you if you curve out with this into a three mana 2-2 two, two disguise card. By playing another creature with power 2 or less, you're making it a 3-3, so it can attack in past your opponent's 2-2, two, two. so it's like it's finding 3 extra damage uh, where you would have hit for 0 instead, so it can really stack up quickly, um, and it's actually a lot better than it looks. Neighborhood Guardian is a premium uncommon. Pick number 4, Person of Interest, is perfect for this kind of deck. We've got the Watchdog that needs the wide board state. We've got the uh, the Neighborhood Guardian that wants us to spit out multiple two powerless creatures. We've got excellent uses for Person of Interest, and we're very happy to take it. Pick number 5, Solid Combat Trick here with Auspicious Arrival is likely the pick. Concealed Weapon is fun, but kind of expensive for what it's doing because when you flip it up like you don't have the 2-2 body anymore so very weird disguise card it's a cool one but and then suspicious detonation is just way less efficient than shock and galvanize which are two other removal spells that red has at common so i tend to just avoid it and play shock and galvanize pick those highly pick six we've got auspicious arrival Case of the Pilfer Proof is for exactly blue-white detectives and nothing else, and even there it's not insane. It's just pretty solid. So it's just another Auspicious Arrival or a Suspicious Detonation. I don't think Shady Informant is quite good enough to be exciting for off-color decks for the hybrid flip-up cost. Uh, unlike Dog Walker and, and Granite Witness and stuff, I think those are the really good hybrid flips. Yeah, just not an excellent pack. We'll just take another Auspicious Arrival. Pick 7. Everything's pretty dry up. At this point, for most people, I guess Cold Case Cracker is actually pretty good for blue-white detectives, so I will take that option. I guess we could also take Sanitation Automaton, because there's not a lot of good 2-mana creatures in this format, and you can tend to get really clumped up at 3-mana, so just having anything to play turn 2 can be pretty valuable for aggressive decks to make sure you're actually curving out. You know what, let's go all in. Let's take the Automaton here. That's a pick 8 Galvanize. That is absurd, and I'm very happy to see it. Pick 9 Offender at Large is not bad at all. This is the perfect top end for these kind of aggressive decks, because most opponents are always going to expect from these sort of Boros decks that they've just got, like, Dog Walkers and stuff face down, so these small creatures that flip up and provide more bodies. So you can sometimes just sneak in extra damage off this, and this sneaks in so much damage that often flipping it is just going to kill your opponent because they're expecting a 3-1 dog walker, and boom, you hit them for 7 now. Uh, another person of interest, pick 10, is an incredible sign. We are very happy to be in red at the very least, but I think we are in a perfect, perfectly fine position to be in Boros aggro. Due diligence is a sorcery speed, combat trick, aura sort of thing. It's not insane, uh, but if you can't get your hand on any of the on the jobs, the plus two, plus one to everybody instant. 
This does a somewhat similar job sometimes, so it can be your like 23rd filler playable uh, if you need it. All right, pack number two. What goodies do you have? Got an inside source. Great three mana card. Curves incredibly with the Neighborhood Guardian, and it curves incredibly into the Karlov Watchdog as well. So I'm pretty happy with that. I think that's the best card for us. The other options are potentially like a Granite Witness, which is worth it. 3-2 Flying Vigilance. That also taps or untaps something when you flip it. That is worth the hybrid mana splash. Just playing it in in uh, in red white and just trying to flip it up for double white that's about it there's a much more dirtily top end card with the braggart i much prefer just defender at larges as the top end in this deck because even if you hard cast these for five mana they're still good at providing a bunch of damage so these are your five drops you want them to be flexible where you can play them early rather than be potentially evasive like the braggart Pack 2, pick 2, another Neighborhood Guardian. This deck's going to be criminal if we find any Dog Walkers. Kind of have to take that over Person of Interest. I think it is less replaceable. With Person of Interest, you can find copies of Person of Interest, copies of Inside Source, and copies of Dog Walker that all do something relatively similar. But I was just saying earlier how there's not a lot of 2-drops in the format. Good ones like Neighborhood Guardian are really high picks, so I'm going to take that. I mean, it really depends on the kind of deck you're doing. There's definitely really good grindy green decks um, and blue decks and stuff. They don't need the two drops as much. If you're a really aggressive deck like Boros, then your two mana really good cards like Neighborhood Guardian are super high picks and Perimeter Enforcer. Now, we aren't in blue-white, so we're not the best archetype for this card where it is going to consistently get those triggers, but it can still get the plus and plus ones off of Inside Source uh, as well as double person of interest. So we can still get some triggers of this, and it makes it really hard for your opponent to outrace you. It's a very solid two drop, and again, you want to take those pretty highly. I think to the point where we take it over on the drop, but that is fierce competition, because that's a big, important finisher for these kind of decks that provide two bodies off one card a lot, again, with person of interest and inside source. So on the drop is a high pick, too, but I think we take a really excellent two mana card over that. Pick four, um, basically nothing here. We just take another offender at large, have that option. Back to pick five, Quintorius. What are you doing? Go back to Strixhaven. What are you doing, play boosters? What is this doing in my Murders at Karlov Manor draft? If this were a paper draft, you could just rare draft all these Leyline of the Guild packs that are running around and sell them for cash monies. This is not a paper draft, though. I guess you could still just rare draft here, because I don't think we're using a third Auspicious Arrival or a Case of the Pilfered Proof. Or definitely not Quintorius. You know what? I, I am actually just going to genuinely rare draft here. Because while it might not be worth money on Arena, it is the key to a really cool modern deck that they might add to Arena, because they're bringing modern Horizons onto Arena and some stuff, so maybe with some anthologies and stuff. Uh, Market Watch Phantom versus Person of Interest is actually pretty difficult, because I think Person of Interest is much better at its mana cost, but the two mana slot is much harder to find the cards for. We've got four already, though, so I'm going to take the Person over the Market Watch Phantom, but it's very close. All right, here I can easily take on the job. Very, very easy there. Now the chase is on. Going to have to cut some of these combat tricks. Probably do like a one of each kind of thing. Have some variety here, make it harder for our opponent to play around stuff. I guess that matters more in best of three when they get to see our deck after the first round, but, you know. Grab a braggart, that'll probably get cut. And we've almost got a full deck here. We're almost at 23 cards. So our third pack could be entirely just focused on improving the deck, which is a really good spot to be in. I am not going to play two chases on, especially when I have two arrivals as well. So I'll take an escape tunnel, but I don't think I'm going to play that unless I like open up a cryptic code or something that I need to splash in. Filler two mana creature. Guess it can make the cut for now since we don't have 23 cards yet. All right, pack three, pick number one. There's another on the job that we might be able to wheel. Because we got this one decently late. 
And then there's Red Herring versus Perimeter Enforcer. I imagine I'm good to take another Perimeter Enforcer here. Or a Red Herring. I like them both. I do not like Assemble the Players. I think unless you have literally like 17 creatures that are castable off of this, it's a little too narrow. Because you hit a land clump and you've done nothing for your two mana, you don't impact the board in any way. Because like even like guaranteed three mana draw two or four mana draw three or something wouldn't be that good in this kind of Boros aggro deck. And that one is not guaranteed at all. All right, pack three, pick two. What's the creature count? 15? Probably have enough creatures to take a shock over a decent two mana card like Red Herring or Market Watch Phantom. These are decent. They're not incredible. Although Market Watch Phantom with the double perimeter enforcer does go up in value being a detective. Also a creature to trigger Neighborhood Guardian. You know what? I only have one Galvanize, one Shock. But I've got Combat Tricks as well, right? So we can just have one of each and then have Combat Tricks to roll over the bigger creatures. Sure, I'm actually going to leverage our Combat Tricks as removal. And just take the, the really excellent two-mana creature there and try to just make the creatures better. I think our non-creature spells are good enough here. Um, pack 3, pick 3, Season Consultant is a fine two-mana card, and it's got that good card type of Detective. It's not excellent, because by itself it's a 1-3, which is pretty bad. But we do have Inside Source and Two Person of Interest to help it attack better. Unfortunately... Somebody is just vacuuming up all the uh, dog walkers in our draft pod, so not going to get any of those for going wide, but at least we're getting plenty inside sources and person of interests, which are basically just as good. We have two inside source, three person of interest. That's pretty solid. Could try to splash in an Alquist, but the more aggressive your deck is, the more hard it is when you stumble on mana, the worse it is to be trying to splash things, so good as Alquist is, I'd rather just keep the deck streamlined here. Pack 3, pick 5, on the job versus makeshift binding. There is a chance that we wheel a different on the job, pick 9. Um, but there's like no chance of wheeling a makeshift binding at this rate, and it's a very good removal spell, because in an aggressive mirror match, it gives you that life gain, that pocket of life to, to get ahead in the race. And if you're not against an aggressive deck, if they're trying to stabilize with a really big blocker, it kills a blocker of any size and doesn't even put it in their graveyard. So I really like makeshift binding. And all right, pick six dog walker. Maybe there just haven't been a lot of dog walkers getting opened, uh, but we'll certainly take that one. I'm going to say if somebody's been scooping up the dog walkers, I wouldn't imagine one runs around pick six. So maybe there just haven't been a lot. Um, I imagine at least a couple have been opened and just have been getting taken. It's just rare draft this. I don't even know what it does, but it's rare, so. Oh, pick eight Karlov Watchdog. Actually incredible. Felonious Rage is not bad at all either. Sometimes you get to curve out really well, uh, where it's like turn four, you play a, a three mana two two face down and you have your one mana Felonious Rage up so that when your creature trades off, you still get a two two onto the board for the turn. Card's real good, and we did wheel the on the drop. That's going to be beautiful. This deck is looking nuts. This is kind of the Boros aggro deck you want to build if you're going for this archetype, so pretty happy to show off a, a good little um, good little kind of archetype guide for, for Boros since we have not drafted that deck yet on the channel. This looks like a solid, solid build of it. So this will be a spicy one. Hopefully it does pretty well. Certainly no bomb rares or anything, so. But that's obviously not, not under our control at all. I think everything else about the deck is pretty much perfect. We've got six of the go-wide creatures that spit out multiple bodies. And we have four of the cards that buff like the whole board as we're doing that kind of stuff. We've got three excellent efficient removal spells. We have the two on the job finishers. Which looks like a great deck. So we have 46 cards here, 19 creatures, 10 non-creatures, so real chunky creature count. Probably drop the expensive braggart and maybe one of the offenders. Keep things nice and low, streamlined here. And that is 17 creatures now and an excellent curve that's quite aggressive, which means we could drop a land here maybe. Probably a red source, looks like we definitely have less red than white. We have no double red cards, we're mostly white-based aggro. 
So drop a mountain down to 16 lands. And then we just drop three non-creatures. Um, some combination of the combat tricks mostly, because the three efficient removal spells are all excellent, and the on the job is going to be a huge finisher for us. So... Just 1-1-1, one, one, one. do that. Call it a deck. Even for a deck this aggressive, I'm perfectly fine running 17 lands, because we do have three 5-drops. Like, we do want to flip these up at the 5 mana, even if we can cast them early. And we do have a little bit of investigating going on to help dig through our deck if we're flooding out, and we do use excess mana to do that. So having some extra 2 mana sitting around by having a, a decent land count does help investigate more because yeah it's going to be three ways to investigate with two on the job one of these combat tricks still in the deck i don't think it would be bad to uh cut one of these and just run 17 lands still if i wanted to cut anything it would just be one of these two combat tricks don't hate that idea at all but i think it's also a perfectly reasonable 16 land deck so I guess, I mean, there's five four-mana plays, and we do really want to hit four-mana turn four, three-mana turn three. We want to consistently hit the curve that we have. We want to stop drawing lands turn five, turn six, but there's no way to, like... There's no land count that's going to be, like, perfect for having four lands turn four every time, but then also not drawing lands after that. There's no, there's no built-in way to do that in Magic, to choose to s change your land ratio after you've hit four lands. You'd be like, okay, so turn four, I will have drawn ten cards if I'm on the play, seven in the opener, and then three draw steps, because you don't draw on the first turn. So I want four out of ten of my cards to have been lands the vast majority of the time. So I want to run more than 40% of my deck as lands, so that I more consistently have you know four drops coming out turn four but if i do that then after that third or fourth draw step 40 percent of my draws well more than 40 percent of my draws are still going to be lands <laughs> there's no way to get around that there's no way to just stop hitting the lands after that curve out till four so that's that's always the sad part about making uh deck adjustments yeah i don't know i i'm pretty greedy i want to just curve out till turn four i think it's okay if i flood a tiny bit because the idea is that hopefully our opponent's just dead by the time that we would have dumped our whole hand out anyway, so it's okay if we're down a card or two because we hit too many lands. So I'm going to drop, uh, I guess, the three mana trick here. Uh, and I will go 17 lands here. And if we end up in a top deck where we're definitely going to lose, we will flood out. But this deck is unlikely to end up in that position. It's like we're going to get board wiped and destroyed or we're just going to crush uh, most of the time. Unless it's a mirror match, then things will be a little interesting. Uh, a little back and forth there. But even a mirror match, I imagine, is going to be like two ships passing in the night. And we're just going to keep attacking past each other and somebody's going to die quick. We'll see. We'll see. I am going to go for the 17 land build, though. And, uh, and just hope we kill our opponents before we get to that point where we would be flooding. So we'll call it a deck here. Actually going to change the land count a little bit. Let's go 10-7 to really make sure we're always hitting on the drop mana. Because if you look at our mana curve, Shock and Galvanize don't have to be played turn 1 turn 2. They're removal spells that are still valuable later. So the first card that needs red mana at its mana value is Person of Interest at 4 mana, so we don't need that much red in this deck. So yeah, we'll go 10-7 and then we will call it a deck. Alright, here's what our completed deck list for today. We are on a Boros aggro deck, and this is kind of the exact sort of archetype that you're going to see a lot in red-white in this format. We're getting a wide board state with cards like Person of Interest, Inside Source, and Dog Walker, all of which are spinning out a token as well as their own body to give us a lot of creatures on the board quickly so that our cards like Neighborhood Guardian are getting extra damage off of the Enter the Battlefield triggers, our Karlov Watchdogs buffing our entire board whenever we attack, and our two copies of On the Job can absolutely find lethal out of nowhere. This can stack up so much extra damage when you have a good chunk of tokens on the board. So that is the general Boros archetype strategy. Of course, as with any aggressive deck, you want to have a great curve of creatures with a lot of two mana plays so that you are curving out turn two, turn three, turn four, trying to overwhelm and steamroll your opponent before they get too much on the board themselves. 
and you definitely want some cheap removal, some cheap combat tricks to break through your opponent's blockers. So we have a shock, a galvanize, a makeshift binding, and an auspicious arrival for that. So that is our deck for today. Without further ado, let's head into the gameplay and see how it does. Here we are on the play for game one. No red source yet, but the hand is still pretty good in a mono-white aggro sense, so we will keep it. Probably start with a Neighborhood Guardian to just press in for as much damage as possible as early as possible. Hit for 3 damage turn 3, rather than just 2 by playing the Perimeter Enforcer first. And actually, we'd only hit for 1 still, because the Enforcer only gets the buffs from Detectives. But the Guardian can buff itself on any creature with power 2 or less. Playing against a blue deck, they start with a Candlestick, very cute little clue equipment. If they've got a board wipe, we could have a pretty big problem, but if they don't, they look like a slower deck here, playing a public thoroughfare for like a double tapped land. So, so far looks like a decent matchup, but there are a lot of board wipes in the format, and those can definitely crush us. It looks like they are blue-red at the very least, but that thoroughfare is a man of any color, so who knows with that one. They are going to pass here, holding up instant speed removal, most likely. Um, this is not a detective, and we won't be attacking with three or more creatures, and it won't trigger Neighborhood Guardian, so there's no reason to play that pre-combat. We just attack in and see what they want to kill. Maybe we get them to soak up their mana so they don't kill our Watchdog. It'd be really nice if they shock our Guardian instead of a Watchdog, and they do. Lightning Helix the Guardian, now we get to play a Watchdog, but we are going to have a real big problem if we still don't find the red source for Person of Interest at this point. We do have seven in the deck, but we have seen none so far. Okay. Worst case scenario, we just exile the face down here, and it is worst case scenario. Drawing another red spell is quite bad. Jam in for four, and they're down to 15. Again, we're on a 10-7 split, so still on average. For every two planes we draw, we should draw one mountain. So, I don't think the 10-7's that... Greedy, I think it's fine for this deck. There's just some variants. Obviously, pre-combat the inside source here so that we do get the buff on the perimeter enforcer. Alright, they're doing some digging. Gotta find a board wipe or some blockers here. There is a blue-red board wipe. Draw two, discard two. Deal damage to everybody equal to the mana value of whatever you discarded. Another inside source now. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a fine play. I could also just use the first inside source to give Vigilance and plus 2 plus 0 to Perimeter Enforcer here. But since they just played a creature last turn, I'm not going to play around the board wipe here. Let's just jam this out. Alright, they're going to bounce the Watchdog. Fair enough. Either way I did this, if I played the inside source or if I activated this one, I wouldn't have the mana up to recast this. Well, that's a little annoying. Uh, now we obviously don't attack it with the 1-1 on the ground either. We do put them down to 10. And the great thing about Karlov Watchdog is it doesn't have to attack for its ability to trigger, so if they don't have hard removal for this, we'll still give the whole board plus one plus one next turn. Just attack with our other creatures, and that will still activate the Watchdog. That's kind of cute there. Disguised card was a weapon. Concealed weapon. All right, here's your demand answers. They are demanding some answers to this board state from their deck. Where's the board wipe? Where did you put it, Arena? 
not there apparently, and we will start things off 1-0, and oh, heading into game 2. Here we are for game 2 with our mana base making fun of us again. Still no red sources. Alright. I mean, if we don't draw any red sources all game, then I can do a tally and be like, how many cards did we draw in the first two games? How far did we go with no mountain? It'd be fun. I mean, this is definitely a keep. It's Phantom into Dog Walker, then we flip the Dog Walker, and we have a wide board state for on the job. We can't really mull this, despite the lack of red. You know, maybe I should swap things over <laughs> to a 9 8, but then I will never hit double white for on the job. There we go! Hey! Complain and get rewarded. That's what it's all about, baby. Drop a Market Watch Phantom and pass the turn. Boros Mirror match it is, and there is a face down. It actually seems like pretty reasonable value in the mirror match with them on the play to try to just kill their face down before they get dogs out of it. So I'm going to do that. Oh, it's a 2-1 though. Dang. That I don't actually care that much about. Just really hoping it's a dog walk or something. Nothing turn four. What is your play here? What is this ruse about? And I guess it's just kill the phantom. One for one removal. No. All right, well, I'm going to inside source into dog walker next turn because I can play and flip it. So that is the most efficient use of my mana these next couple turns. I mean, the most efficient would be to play the dog walker face up and the neighborhood guardian, but with the on the job in hand, I really want to flip the dog walker, so we're not going to do that. That's not good. I can fly over that. We're fine. Yeah, let's just fly over that and then on the job the whole board and kill them next turn. It's probably not lethal, but I'd like to imagine it is. It's fun to dream. I mean, it's four, five, six creatures attacking in next turn, and they have two blockers. Four creatures get in for at least three damage apiece. It's at least 12 damage. It's probably lethal, actually, which is absurd. But that's how these decks work. Yeah, I mean, if they just... If they have a shock, they're good. But if they don't have a shock, like... This is not, like, quite lethal if they block our biggest creatures, but we kill both of their biggest creatures and put them down to, like, two life. Okay, well, that was already going to attack, so we're cool with that. Hustle to send a message. And I believe they saved themselves from dying, but they're at one life with no creatures. Yeah, there's the one life. Arena did the math for us right quick because they hit the scooped. And it was going to be one life with no creatures left on their board. So yeah, again, unless they had a board wipe in their deck, which is quite unlikely for a Boros aggro deck to have. That is just the GG from the on the job after multiple creatures that spit out extras. The inside source plus dog walker popping off. I don't know how our dog walker ended up betraying us. It was sitting on their side of the board after they could seen it. But that's cool too. Alright, we're 2-0 and heading into game 3. Alright, we've got great mana again game 3. We do need to draw into some lands this time though. So I guess while we have both of our colors like we did last game, we do need to hit a higher quantity of lands. It's still a keep though. Neighborhood Guardian into Offender into the Persons. But... Definitely a risk here, because we are actually trying to find multiple lands. Four mana is where we really pop off here, which is why we're going for the full 17 over 16, because four mana is so important. Dang, that's not good at all. Um, I really don't like this, but I think I have to just get a clue token so that if I miss a land again, I'm at least cracking a clue next turn. Trying to find land three and then just playing it out after I tap out. All right, our opponent has perfect three color mana turn three, Mountain Swamp Island. Okay, we did naturally hit land three, so that's useful. And here's where that neighborhood guardian really pops off, what I was talking about. Where, like, 
If it weren't for its ability, we'd be hitting for zero damage this turn, so while it's only technically giving something plus one plus one, it's finding three extra points of damage we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So, again, so much more than it looks like. Like most of these combat trick kind of abilities, like the Traveling Minister back in Innistrad Crimson Vow, was just a one-mana creature you could tap to give something plus one plus zero till end of turn. But that plus one plus zero, that made your two twos attack into three threes and threaten to trade. All right, now we have lived the dream. We just start slamming down person of interests. And uh, then we on the draw blader. I imagine we let them kill one of our creatures with a three power face down. If this is the three two gadgeteer or whatever. It feels like a safer line than just dumping both power onto the Guardian, because then if they just like shock the Guardian in response, we hit for zero. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to murder the Guardian, so we found three damage this turn instead of zero damage, so... Yeah, those were the two things we could play around there. We could have played around instant speed removal, or we could have played around a three power face down. Looks like it was a good thing we played around the, the removal here. So now that I don't have a Neighborhood Guardian on board, we get to attack in holding up an on the job and just see what happens. Uh, but we're probably not doing it. Depends on their face down. If it's a Fender at large, maybe it's worth trading up into the 4 Toughness card. It's a 3 mana flip, so it's a 1-4. Okay, that I don't care enough about. And I guess I am putting them down to 2 life if I cast on the job. They're at 2 life and they have no blockers left. And it plays well around a board wipe, which I like. Yeah, maybe this is overly scared of board wipes, but I'm going to cast on the job. Because even if they don't have the board wipe, this is still pretty great. They're at two life. There's a menace creature and two other attackers on our board. They got to do a lot to survive here. If they do have the board wipe, this is an infinitely better play than playing something post-combat. And I have died to board wipes a lot in this set, but it looks like not today. Is this going to be the <laughs> the one draft we see zero board wipes from our opponent? Would be kind of sick. Would be kind of sick. We are 3 and 0 oh now heading into game 4. All right, game number 4, excellent mana here. Enforcer into person of interest isn't the perfect curve. There's nothing to do turn 3, but we have a lot of two mana creatures in our deck as well as plenty of disguise cards for 3 mana, so um yeah, I was going to say relatively likely to find something to drop out here. I guess it's just as much damage whichever way that I order these two. Uh, but this way I get to gain two life when I hit them. So probably worth it. Plus, I get to get right around the 1-3 on the ground. I guess I could do that anyway, because the, the Phantom would be flying when I play the Enforcer. So yeah, I guess it literally didn't matter the, the direction I curved out here, except for the life gain. But the life gain was worth it. Alright, perfect timing on land number four. You love to see it. Our opponent can't block either of these. They're taking four damage in the sky, and we are just going to magical Christmas land dream curve town this game. Our opponent cannot be enjoying their position currently. I mean, they've had a good start. They're just on the draw. Like, they played... Not the greatest 2-drop ever, but with Inside Source being an incredible 3-drop that also synergizes with the 2-drop, like, they've had a very good start for most games, but we were on the play, so I feel a little better over here. I guess it really depends on their 4-mana play, because the Person of Interest turn 4 was, like, the icing on the cake. That was the biggest best card to work with this curve because it triggered both of our detectives to get that extra damage in in the sky and gave us a wide board state at the same time yeah they've got a good four drop as well not quite as good as person of interest but definitely useful um they're at 14 i imagine we're just jamming on in Kind of want to play another person of interest and just clear this tracker out of the way. And then on the drop next turn for lethal. 
Yeah, I don't love attacking with the 2-2s two on the ground because they can block with a 1-3 and a 1-1, one, one, and I trade into a 1-1 one, one with one of them. So I think we just do this. We trade into the Griffnot Tracker and uh, hope that that is a wide enough board state for us to get around enough of their creatures to kill them with on the drop next turn. We do play this land in case I top deck land 6, then I could double up the tricks to really go for lethal. Another inside source. Alright, it's not going to be a wide enough board state, but we can, like, kill their whole board without losing any of our creatures, which is still going to be worth it. So they're not going to be dead, but we will have the superior board after this. They could try to block in a way that's just, like, as best as possible against Von the Drob. In which case, we might see if Auspicious Arrival is better. It's quite unlikely, but... We'll see. Second on the job means if we leave enough creatures on this board, there's almost nothing they're going to be able to do to survive. But it also means that we don't get to play on the job and auspicious arrival. And if we could do that, it would be like completely impossible for our opponent to block well. So I do think I would have preferred a sixth land, but out of anything we could have drawn in our deck, on the job is certainly not a bad one. Yeah, our opponent knows knows the game, knows the format. They are going for the best blocks they can find against On the Job. They're trying to. They're thinking to get blocking with three power against the two toughness cards. Trying to line it up. Oh, maybe not. Okay, yeah, that's a pretty good block against On the Job. So let's see. Um, we kill both of those and lose that. We kill, let's see, four power. We kill one of these. Four power, we kill one of these. That's actually a, a pretty smart block all around, for sure. Uh, yeah, kill both, and then kill the 2-2 two, two over the 1-3 here. Doesn't really matter, because we're giving the whole board plus, two, one, plus 1 again next turn, so... Oh, 4 power does still kill both of these. Kills both of these. It just only kills one over here. Okay, yeah, we're, we're fine. Yeah, they're at four life. They have one creature left. We got two tricks in hand. I can both find lethal. There's a Tesa. If I lost life, they get to investigate, and every time they sack a clue, they get a 1-1. One -one. Well, now they know they're not dead. They've got three blockers. Uh, but they have to block everybody, and then I on the job to kill their whole board while keeping some creatures. Uh, and then we win. Yep, lose one creature to the death touch, but everybody else is still around. They're down to four against four power of creatures. It's a Wisp Drinker Vampire for one blocker. But Auspicious Arrival still gets there, unless they have a one-mana removal spell, which, never gonna say never with play boosters now, um, but I don't think there's any in the format. But with play boosters, now that there's the list cards where there's random reprints from a bunch of older sets, like you can get hard evidence from a Modern Horizon set, you can get, uh, you can get a listed worm from a Lara Reborn, uh, maybe there is something crazy in the list that's a one mana white removal spell but if there is they didn't have it there and we continue the undefeated streak making it all the way to four and oh the basically break even point for premier draft super happy with that but we'll see how far we can take it heading into game number five Ooh, mono white aggro hand again i mean i'm gonna keep it guardian in the watchdog we are on the draw here we could definitely fall behind especially with two combat tricks if they have two removal spells but Let's see how we draw. I'm going to go for it. Uh-oh. Red spell is the first draw. I put red spells in here? I thought we're mono-white aggro. Ooh. Well, there's the mountain for the red card. We still don't have a second two drop or a three drop in the hand, so we have nothing to do turn three. 
Other than that, though, I still like the hand. Those draws have been decent. I mean, making sure that we hit the red source was very nice. But the person of interest is just a decent draw, considering we already had a really good four mana play. Case File Auditor. That is a brick wall right there. One four body looks for an enchantment. They do not find one, and now I have a three mana play if I want to make shift binding the auditor, but I really don't. I would much rather auspicious arrival, so I'm hoping they block here. They don't. Oh. I can't imagine that I'm supposed to throw my makeshift binding there when there are a lot of potentially scarier blockers available in this set at higher mana values. Okay, that one's not scarier. That one can easily lose to a combat trick. I'm mean, gonna guess the Auditor can too, but... I guess the problem with that one is it's gonna have a pretty good time trying to outrace us with the lifelink. But if I find my Shock or my Galvanize, any of our other removal is big enough to demolish a one toughness card. So curving about, curving out a bit here to set up the Watchdog next turn, if we want to go for that. Again, the lifelink's annoying, but I don't think it's worth stopping uh, expanding our board state when we have on the job and Watchdog really incentivizing us to get this board wide. Plus, if I really want to, we can have a very mana efficient turn five of Arrival plus Binding. Okay, face down card's fine. Face down card actually makes it look like uh, Arrival plus Binding could be a great turn for us. So I'm going to set that up here. And if we don't need to do it, we can still just play Watchdog post combat. I mean, I don't love the arrival here since we aren't killing the uh, face down, but I don't hate it either. We could also just on the job kill the auditor and hit them for eight. Um, but then I don't binding the life linker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the thing. I'm going to binding the life linker here and uh, kill the auditor. Get them to 12, get rid of their life gain. Still got that next turn watchdog if we need it. It's a vigilante. Okay. Uh, if I watchdog, I hit them for six and lose a 3 3. If I on the job, I hit them for eight and I actually trade into the vigilante. So on the job is actually just straight up better here. Problem is, watchdog won't be triggering on next turn's attack anymore. I could just not attack this turn, but I can't imagine that's correct. We just attack with the Menace card and play the Watchdog. Don't get the trigger this turn, put them to 10. But that just gives them more time to stabilize here. I think it's a lot harder to stabilize if we rip their 4-4 blocker off the board and put them to 4 life. I guess I probably should have cracked the clue before I used on the job, because then we could have seen if maybe there's a better thing to do for four or less. Like, we could have top-decked Galvanize, I guess. And then Galvanize would have been the best play, just kill the 4-4 four, four and attack with everybody. Since uh, if you drew an extra card, so if you drew two cards in your turn, then you do get to Galvanize for five instead of three, so could have maybe cleared the Vigilante out of the way. Okay, they are done attacking. Fair enough. Alright, we would not have hit a Galvanize, so... Did not matter that sequencing. I forgot we have two Neighborhood Guardians. That's so gross. Well... 
they're black white this can't be anything that blocks person of interest they have to play something else to block our menace here so let's dig and see if we can draw a combat trick that would just kill them still got another on the job that would kill them if they can't block person of interest okay that is not a combat trick but it's not a bad draw let's let's do some pre-combat stuff here let's threaten three damage to them if we can. I don't think that it's right to buff the detective. Because if this is anything with more than... More than two toughness naturally, it'll just win the fight. Or more than three toughness naturally. So let's just hope for the no removal and we do get to put them to one here. There is removal, it's not even that big of a deal. Yeah, it's not great for us, but not that big of a deal with a watchdog coming up that can still try to find lethal next turn. If they do have one more removal spell, they stop the watchdog from buffing our whole board. But they're down to two cards. They have only played one removal spell, though, so... Ooh. Oh my god, we have eight mana? Well... I guess we're doing both. So if they have instant speed removal, they're still fine here. We move to combat, they instant speed removal the neighborhood guardian, we attack with the other two. Watchdog does not trigger. And if they let Consultant through, they'll still be alive. But... While they will still be alive, and they'll still be fine, we also will be fine. Like, we're not massively behind against instant speed removal. Because we'll still get the clue token, they'll still be at one life, we'll probably wipe their board. So yeah, they did have the instant speed removal, which is a little bit of a bummer, but... We still gotta go for this here. If they block the wrong creature without another instant speed removal spell, they're dead. Let's see that instant speed removal. And they do not have an additional instant speed removal spell, so 5 and 0 oh it is. Boros aggro, the menace of the format, strikes again. It is a very nice, very strong archetype here. Here we are now for game 6. We are curving out Enforcer into Inside Source into Watchdog is pretty wild. Time to reveal a shock to my opponent, just in case they play a really good one drop. Actually, I don't think there's any one mana spell that I would want to just shock immediately, so... Let's play the planes. So that the uh, arena doesn't hold for shock every single end step and just tell my opponent exactly what I have. Okay, I would not have hated shocking that. <laughs> Oops. Is what it is. Now they get to play a disguise card for only two, and they actually get to curve out on blocks here. Yeah, I actually wish I didn't go for the F6 value and did just shock a mask maker. If we lose the game by just a little bit of tempo, that was self imposed. overthinking things, trying to play around the arena. Uh, cheaty face telling our opponent that we have shock. Tap out Murder Enforcer, that's fine. Okay. Uh, drop a person of interest this turn. No blocks, cool. That's extra damage, here's person of interest. Case of the stashed skeleton does not help our opponent at all until they sack that skeleton or something. Uh, watchdog and trigger it, I think, over the on the job here. Now they can't flip up their face down. Which is super rude. And we're buffing the whole board. They can flip up their face down during their turn, but right now they can't flip it. All 
All right, combat trick sliced from the shadows to win that fight. They're down to seven. Another face down. Skelly Man comes right on in. Our entire board comes right on in. There's the attempt to survive, and on the job ends that real quick. And we are 6 and 0, oh, heading into the final battle, undefeated. Um, yeah, that game was just a gross curve out that would have been even grosser if I had just shocked the Mask Maker turn 1. Then they did not have a turn 2 play for a blocker, so things would have been even more disastrous. But even then, ridiculous curve. Ridiculous curve out from the Boros aggro. Here we are for game number seven, the final boss. Definitely looking to draw some non-lands, but I do like having both colors in the opener, all the mana we need to get to the Watchdog, preferably finding some two or three mana creatures to play turn three after the Perimeter Enforcer. So it is definitely reliant on drawing decently, but if we do, it will be great. And we did find a seasoned consultant at least. Not incredible. Inside Source would have been the best draw. That would have been insane. Uh, but it's still decent. Still triggers the Enforcer to get in for two. Still gives us a second creature out of the three for Watchdog. All right, bounce the um, Enforcer is not terrible for me, but certainly not great. Mono blue so far from our opponent. Here comes a 2-2. Two -two. Yep. Face down card. Got a defender at large to play at five mana. Imagine we're dropping the Watchdog here. Now they can't trick us with their face down at all. Probably should have poked for one. They might not have blocked. They might have tried to play around a combat trick there. They probably would just block and then it doesn't matter, but I don't need to hold this up as a blocker at all. So I might as well have attempted to sneak in some damage. All right, I imagine playing this face up is the best line here. Get the consultant in or just trade it into analyst. I guess just trading it here isn't awesome. Maybe the best line is actually to just get a wide board to trigger the watchdog soon. Actually, I'm going to go for that. Trigger the watchdog and season consultant. Those are both a good chunk of extra damage. Okay, there's the cold case cracker. I could pre-combat galvanize that. If I do, then perimeter enforcer is definitely not going to die here, but I don't have the mana to flip up the offender at large. This attacks is a 4-4. Four, four. This is a 4-3. They can just block it with just Analyst. I guess I galvanize an attack with everybody except Watchdog, because Watchdog for Analyst is not a good trade, but every other trade is pretty in my favor. Yeah, every other trade does feel pretty firmly in my favor. I guess it's still just 3-3 three, three for, uh, for Analyst here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, they take eight damage if they trade with Watchdog, but I'm not. I'm not putting Watchdog in there. It's too good. All right. Analyst trades very well. And then we get that board white again. Blue does not have any board wipes, but we don't know what their second color is. So maybe we should be playing it safe against board wipes. I will never not live in fear of board wipes after I got so demolished by, by a couple in the past. And I demolished a lot of people with a couple as well in our green, blue, red deck. The blue, red board wipe was absolutely pivotal uh, for that. What a draw. Goodbye, Watchdog. Back on top of my deck? Sure. A little sad, but fine. Still will be a good play next turn. You know what, just flipping, I was going to say, just flipping this is probably going to be just as good as on the dropping here, so let's just flip it. And that is pretty good. It's two less damage than if I used on the job, but it is a massive board here. Alright, makeshift binding. I can hit them for six, which is not lethal, so we just play a watchdog and hit for two then. Makeshift Binding, showing off how great it is, that life gain pocket being super helpful for them. 
they have found their second color now. They are blue-white. Face down card. Pass turn. I'm going to play this land in case they have... Okay. I was going to say I'm going to play this land in case they have the counter unless I pay three. So we can get around that with our on the drop. Uh, that is a blue and a white for that counter spell. Um, but apparently they're over it. Their face down was Unyielding Gatekeeper. So they could have like exiled the Watchdog, giving us a 2 2. All right. Yeah, I mean, Gatekeeper was a pretty good face down. They still had four in hand, so I don't know exactly what the concession was. Maybe they knew. Maybe they knew I had on the job and they're like, no, nope, I'm done. Or something came up. It happens too. But yeah, we, we were definitely in the lead still, even with all those cards in their hand. So could just be a regular everyday concession of like, well, I'm not winning this game. I don't know, though. Seems slightly weird. Slightly weird, but we will take it. That is a seven-win undefeated run. I believe that's our third trophy of the format and our first undefeated run, which is pretty dang sick. I think it's my fourth or fifth trophy, if you count off-screen off drafts, non-recorded drafts. But I think it's the third. it's the third trophy video, so that's pretty sweet. And yeah, our first Boros aggro deck, and it is just a perfect little picture of what this archetype wants to be doing. So if you see that Boros is pretty open in your draft pod, if you see the inside sources going late, the neighborhood guardians going late, you should definitely be hopping onto white aggro and getting as many cards as you can that spit out detective tokens, 1-1 dog tokens, anything like that, and topping off your curve with some on the job. So those are things you can do at... Uh, at common, taking inside sources, dog walkers, and person of interests, and then on the jobs at the top of the curve. So those are really consistent things you can try to be doing in this archetype. But of course, when you see the premium uncommons as well, you want to do that to Karlov watchdogs being insane, neighborhood guardians being insane, just everything in the deck really popping off for a full undefeated run. And it's going to be 2,200 gems, and six packs of Murders at Karlov Manor as our prizes. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.